Hello and welcome back, and today we're finishing off the miniature Centurion. Now if you missed the previous episode, uh, we have a little bit of a problem, and that is that there is a local retro computing meetup coming up at the end of the month, which is now frighteningly close, we've got like seven days, uh, but I wanted to have something Centurion to take to that meetup. Obviously this big boy isn't going. The Hawk Drive alone weighs like 130 pounds and it's way too big to put into an SUV with any form of grace. So I wanted to make something as small and light as possible that was still distinctly Centurion. And this case was the result, which I think is a wonderful homage to the real deal. I think it looks absolutely fantastic, even if we uh, did whiff on some of the color matching here, but I think it looks brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it doesn't work because we didn't wire anything up in the previous episode. So that's what we're gonna do today. We still have to wire up power, and then we have to wire up the front panel and the floppy drive into the computer itself. And then once we get all of that wired up and ready to go, we gotta try and figure out what to do for software. We gotta get an operating system install onto a floppy disk, but the floppy disks are really small. We've only got 96 tracks to play with, and the operating system takes up like 95 tracks. So on a single floppy system, that is exceedingly useless. So we need to figure out a way to sort of min-max our operating system install, bring its installation size down as far as possible to open up as many spare tracks as possible so that we can put more applications onto that floppy disk and actually make the system usable. So we've got a lot to cover today uh, and we're gonna start with the power supply. So I'm gonna spin this around and dive straight into it. Let's get started. We'll start by getting some measurements of the opening in the back between the two side pieces, then a quick measurement of how tall the supplies will be when stacked up, and uh, then we'll make a mark on some scrap plywood left over from building the case, give it a quick chop on the radial arm saw, and then next, let's get the actual side and top off. And so we'll remove the screws holding the side panels on, then we'll lift the whole unit off and set it below the table. Now that I have easy access to everything, we'll remove the back plane and uh, move it to the proper side of the mounts because I mounted it backwards last time. And then we'll get it mounted back into the card cage and that'll let me mock up the power supply board that we just cut to check clearances between the power supplies that'll be mounted to it and the back of the card cage. Uh, let's go ahead and place the power supplies where we want them and then we will uh, screw them down to hold them firmly in place. But the five volt supply didn't come with screw holes or the proper brackets, so I'm, I'm gonna have to make some. So I uh, quickly chopped an L bracket in two, then went over to the metal brake to give it a 90 degree bend, and uh, those are going to work perfectly to hold the uh, five volt power supply in place. Next, I want to mount the power switch. So I'm going to chop up some scrap aluminum that we had, and then I'll clean the edges of the cut piece off with a file so I don't end up slicing my fingers completely apart. Then after a quick measure, I'll drill the hole for the switch, then screw the bracket into place on the power supply board, and finally pop the switch in and tighten it down. One thing we can't forget is the real-time clock signal. Normally this comes from a special winding off the uh, transformer in the ferro-resonant power supply, which supplies a 60 hertz signal to the NE567, I believe, on the back plane to generate the real-time clock signal. However, I don't have that signal, so I'm going to replicate it using a 555 timer. And it's just a simple A-stable multivibrator with a potentiometer to adjust it to 60 hertz perfectly. And with that built up on a perf board, we'll mount it to the power supply board as well. We'll just measure the holes, pre-drill, and then thread in some standoffs. And these are actually the same standoffs that I use on the tube computer. They work fantastically. Next, let's get mains electricity up to the power supplies themselves. So I'll drill a hole for the cable to pass through. Then I need to uh, mount the cable down to the wood for strain relief. So I'll use these little clamps with nails that you hammer in, as well as some zip ties for extra strength. And then starts the incredibly long and tedious process of wiring it all up. And I'm gonna start by just wiring in the mains through a fuse to the switch, then running the live neutral 
neutral and ground mains to all four supplies. Okay, we're chugging along fine with the wiring, but we have an interesting problem that I wasn't predicting. Uh, this is the primary five volt supply. That's why it's so big. It's got a ton of power behind it. Uh, and then this is going to be plus 12 and minus 12 or vice versa, whichever way it ends up wiring. And this is plus 24 up here, but we don't really care about plus 24 because it's only for the floppy drive. And uh, well, I know that it's not going to cause a problem. So the issue that I'm thinking about is that uh, with plus 12 and minus 12 here, if we look at the little green LEDs that uh, these three supplies have, plus 12 and minus 12 seem to turn on quite a bit faster than plus five. So I'll flip the switch here and watch the green LEDs. So these two green LEDs came on about a full second, maybe two seconds faster than the five volt supply over here. Uh, I don't think this is gonna cause too many problems, but uh, I just want to be safe about it, so I'm actually going to uh, make a little uh, relay setup here. Um, and so this is just going to use a, a couple of relays to trigger the plus 12 and minus 12 at the same time that the plus 5 volt comes on, since it's the slowest supply. Now, I don't have uh, the correct 5 volt relay to do this cleanly, so I'm going to use a smaller 5 volt relay to trigger two big 12 volt relays. Uh, and that's actually what this little board right here is going to be. I haven't soldered this up yet. I still got to run all the solder wires for it and get it wired up correctly, but uh, that is our next step. With our relay board all soldered up, let's go ahead and get it mounted. And just like the real-time clock board, we're just going to pre-drill some holes and thread in some of the same standoffs. Now, before we wire up all of the DC voltages, let's get the supply board mounted to the chassis. And I'm going to do that with some hinges so that the supply board can actually swing open for working on it. So I'm just going to screw the hinges in place and... Yeah, yeah, that works excellently. Plenty of clearance went up and it drops down to make it easy to work on. And then we're back into more wiring. And for anyone curious, this time lapse was filmed using my now very old GoPro Hero Sessions. And the uh, frame rate it was shooting at was one shot every five seconds, which means that every one second you see here is approximately two and a half minutes in real time. All right, I think I've got everything wired up correctly. I genuinely haven't tried flipping the power on this yet, so I have no idea what's gonna happen. I've got two multimeters hooked up. One is on the five volt rail. The other one is on the negative 12 volt rail. And uh, I'm doing this to check two things essentially. I wanna make sure that the voltage levels are pretty accurate. Uh, and I also wanna make sure that they both move at the same time. If the negative 12 volt rail moves before the five volt rail, that means that my relay circuit thing over here is not working correctly. I hope it doesn't go up in smoke, but um, uh, here goes nothing. Well, I've got five volts, but I don't have uh, negative 12 volts. That's not good. Um, nothing seems like it's going up in smoke though. All right, simple, simple mistake. I just had the uh, common and the normally closed on this little white relay wired up backwards. Uh, I misunderstood the uh, data sheet. Uh, I've got two multimeters here. This one is hooked up to negative uh, 12. This one's hooked up to positive 12. Uh, so we'll go ahead and flip the switch here. I heard the relays click. There's plus 12, there's minus 12. Uh, that is correct. <laughs> Nothing's backwards. Nothing has gone up in smoke. Uh, all three voltages come on at exactly the same time. That is epic. Uh, okay, so next we need to get this little 555 timer here. We need to get it set up to exactly 60 hertz. So I'm gonna pull out the scope and uh, do that right quick next. Scope is out. Let's flip the power on. And yeah, there we go. We've got a uh, square wave going on there. We'll slow it way down so that we can get a look at what the actual frequency is. Uh, and it looks like we're at about 37.9 hertz. It's a little slow. Uh, so that's what this little potentiometer on here is for. Uh, we'll just go ahead and give it a spin. See if we can get this right on up to 60 hertz. That's 46. 
There's 59, 60.9. There we go, 60.26 hertz. That's uh, not perfect, but very, very, very close. It just means that while we're saving files, we're just gonna get maybe a couple of seconds of drift per day or something like that. Uh, really not a huge deal. With the power supply mostly sorted, let's get some cooling going on here. And I'm gonna use two 120 millimeter 12 volt fans but I need mounting brackets to uh, mount these fans in place. So again, I'm gonna give a little cut on the angle grinder, then I'll clean it up on the bench grinder to remove any sharp edges, and then I'll take it over to the brake and give it a double bend to give it a little kink to more properly align with the fans. And that makes mounting the fans an absolute breeze. Uh, see, what I, see what I did there? Um, anyways, to wire them up, I'll just crimp the positive wires together, then take the 12 volt directly off of the 12 volt lug on the back plane. For the ground, I actually have to extend it. So I'll solder a wire to the two grounds from the two fans and then connect that wire up to a ground lug on the back plane. And then we'll give it a quick test and excellent. That's gonna move some air across the cards, nice. So next, let's get some ribbon cables run, which means it's time to dig into my ribbon cable box. I'll plug the cables into the front panel and I'm gonna make extra sure that I completely block the camera with my back here so you can't see anything. Now next, I need some brackets to hold the cables in place. So I'll give them a, a quick chop on the metal and then I'll drill a mounting hole, screw it in place, and then slip the ribbon cables behind the bracket to firmly hold them. And then we'll rinse and repeat that procedure again for a second bracket, and the cables are now nicely managed. We'll plug the big one into the back plane, and the small one will get plugged into the CPU 6 card. And speaking of cards, I want to use the memory card from the counterfeit machine but it has some serious water damage. And so I'm hoping that we can fix this. So I'll carefully remove all of the corroded chips from the sockets, but some of these are so bad that they're coming apart in the socket. That's just truly a ton of corrosion. I've got all the uh, chips around the trouble area out, uh, and really the PCB looks pretty good. It looks like the uh, solder mask did its job and protected the traces underneath, so I was really afraid that there was going to be PCB damage, but I think it's going to be okay. So the concern is now on the uh, sockets here, uh, most notably this socket right here, because uh, that socket is where this chip was, and uh, the corrosion was so bad on it that pin 16 here broke off and is still in the socket. I can actually see it in there. Um, so that socket is gonna have to come out and get replaced. Uh, and hopefully that's the only one. Some of these are pretty gross, but I'm gonna go over this with some alcohol and some deoxid and clean these up as best as I can. Uh, and then we'll clean up all of the remaining 4116s and uh, I have a little DRAM tester here, uh, this guy that I got, um, and it tests 4116s, will let me know if they're good or not. And uh, if I have a bad 4116, I'm actually just gonna replace it with a 4164 using this guide that I found on uh, Atari Age. Uh, 4116s and 4164s share an almost identical pinout. Um, all we do is we just tie A7 to VCC because, well, that's where VCC is coming in on the 4116. Uh, and then we have to uh, tie pin eight to pin nine so that it's actually getting VCC. And then we just snip off pin one, which is a no connect. So I've got a bunch of 4164s. We'll put those in the place of uh, dead 4116s, um, but we'll try to reuse as many of those as we can. So let's go ahead and get this board as clean as we can. Uh, we'll replace this one socket for sure. And then we'll give it a test and see how it goes. To remove the bad socket, we'll start by adding new solder to all of the pins of the socket. And then I'll get my hand desoldering iron out to suck out as much of the bad solder as I can. And it goes about as smooth as you'd expect. So I'll pry off what I can of the socket and then desolder the remaining pins one at a time. And once that's out and clean, a new socket goes in and it gets soldered to the back. 
And now we start trying to save some of our 4116 RAM chips. A uh, scrub and a test, and yeah, this one seems like it's still good. Uh, but th this one is very much so not good. Just gives us a little red light there. Ultimately, I need about 10 replacements, so it's time to start modifying our 4164 RAM chips. And so we just bend up pin 8, solder it to pin 9 with a jumper wire, then we'll snip pin 1 and drop it into the socket, and uh, there we go. All 10 look pretty good. Uh, now just to slip the memory card into the card cage. Okay, we're hitting the moment of truth here. Uh, this is genuinely the first power on test. Uh, I'm just looking for a D equals prompt on the terminal here. Now the terminal is on and flashing fail here, which is telling me that it failed some self test that it does, but it still functions as a dumb terminal. And really that's all we care about. So I've actually confirmed that this terminal and the cable that I made up for it work by plugging them into the genuine system and I got a D equals prompt out of the genuine system. So uh, if we have a failure, it's not on this part. The terminal is working correctly. Now in order to get to a D equals prompt, what we need is a working CPU six card, a working MUX card, and a working memory card. And that's the only three cards that I have in there right now. So we don't have the FFC, we're not doing anything with the floppy, we're just looking to see if it gets through the bootstrap ROM and displays D equals up here. So, uh, <laughs> well, here goes nothing. Let's give it a shot. That's something, it says error. I'm just getting error over and over and over again. But it's displaying something. That's, that's actually more than I was expecting, less than I was hoping. Um, so that tells us that the MUX card is definitely working. The CPU 6 card is probably working just fine as well. Probably it's our uh, memory card here. So I'm going to swap that out with uh, one from the genuine machine and uh, give it another test and see if this error goes away. All right, it was a little more involved than I was expecting. I tried three different memory boards in here. None of them made any difference. Tried different MUX cards in here. They didn't make any difference. I pulled the CPU 6 card out, tested it in the genuine machine. The CPU 6 card seems to work totally fine. I get a D equals prompt out of it. Uh, and so that meant that we were down to just it being either the front panel or the back plane. And the front panel, all the LEDs were lighting up, and it was actually showing an address, which was in a random incorrect address, but it was actually showing an address, and the button would reset it. So I was starting to think it's not the front panel. And on the back plane, there's really only one major thing that we got to look at, and that's uh, this little guy right here. This is the bootstrap ROM. But fortunately, I have a spare bootstrap ROM that I got from Ken Romain. So I popped it in and uh, check, check it out. We'll flip the power on. There we go. D equals. We got a D equals prompt. <laughs> uh, now, it's uh, not all fun and games just yet because uh, I, I think we should get error or something whenever I type in a disk to boot from. So if I type H0... Uh, it just, it just freezes. It just locks up completely. I don't get an error. I don't get anything. It just comes to a, a halt. Um, but I think it's time to plug the Diag card in, maybe run a few tests, make sure that things are looking somewhat copacetic. Uh, and then let's try to get the floppy and the FFC card into this and to try to get it booting something. I've done a bit of playing around with the Diag card and I think the Mini Centurion system is operating well enough for us to actually make our operating system. Uh, now, I'm gonna show you guys the problem. I've got the Hawk drive spun up here. So let's take a look at the Hawk uh, directory. That's gonna be .dir1. Uh, and at sys is a library, a folder, if you will, that contains all of the files for our operating system. So we can see here it says at sys type L for library, tracks 64. So the etsys library takes up 64 tracks, right? Well, let's look in the actual etsys library. Uh, so we'll get to the end here and we'll do a dot dir uh, etsys dot one. We'll hit enter on that. 
And then these are all of the files that are in the etsys library. They all start with et, et and they all have some strange name, ojx or tx or whatever. Uh, and well, there's not really a whole lot that we can glean from that. But when we get to the end is where it gets interesting. We can see it says used tracks 39 six sectors. If we looked back at the previous one, it said we had 64 tracks. And then we see it says available 24 tracks. And that's because libraries or folders don't really work in the way that we think they do. Each library is like its own self-contained disk. And so when you make that library, you set it up to be a certain size. And then you fill it with files up to that size. And so a library can actually get full. It requires a lot of forethought and thinking about how you're going to set up your file system, which is something that I hadn't thought about. Uh, so you have to make a new library that is the size of the stuff you're going to put in it, then you have to put it in it. So it makes sense to oversize the library. So you've got a little bit of headroom in there. And that's exactly what they did with the etsys library here. But that means that when we copy etsys over to a floppy, it's going to take up a lot more space than it needs to. So what we need to do when we copy our operating system over to the floppy is make a new library that is exactly the size we need it to be and then fill it with all of the files. And that's incredibly tedious to do by hand, but Rin has been working on a script to make this a lot easier. So Rin, if you're watching, thank you so much. This is gonna be a massive time saver. Uh, and in order to make that script, we have to go back to our old friend Compose. But the script is huge. It's like 500 lines long. There's no way I'm going to type all of that into Compose without making a thousand mistakes and just ripping my hair out again. So the trick is going to be connecting up a laptop as a terminal and then just using that to essentially type for us, which is exactly what I have set up over there. Uh, so if I go to s.compose, uh, it's going to start this. We're going to make our file name bld min os. Uh, so we're going to build our minimum operating system. We're not going to put that in any folder. We're going to put that on disk one. It's not found. We will create it, yes. And then our output device is crt0. And that puts us at the compose prompt. Uh, now to start inserting text, I'm going to hit K and then enter and we're ready to start typing text. Uh, but I'm not going to type in the script. It's way too long. So I'm going to alt tab over to notepad here. I'm going to hit control A to select everything. I'm going to copy it, alt tab back over to Terraterm. Then I'm going to do alt V to paste the text. Uh, and then we'll just hit OK and let it do the typing for us. <laughs> that is so much better. Uh, it's still going to take a while because I had to set up a delay of one millisecond after each character and 10 milliseconds after each new line to kind of cope with how fast this could actually send text. Uh, but copying this over is going to take a while. So we're going to sit here and let it run for a minute. All right, back over here on the main system, if we look at the directory listing, we can see we've got uh, BLD MINOS build min operating system. So we're just going to run it. So if I do a dot STA here, uh, we can see that we have three drives. We have uh, data six soft term. Those are the two platters on our Hawk drive. And then we have min OS. That is a fresh floppy with nothing on it. So we'll just do uh, BLD min OS, hit enter. The source disk number is going to be disk one. That's where all of our files are. The uh, target disk is disk two. So that's the floppy. We'll hit enter on that. Uh, it may be guarded here. Yeah, it's guarded. We got to no guard the floppy. So we'll do dot uh, N O G U A R D two. That's going to unguard our floppy. That's like a software write protect. So let's try this again. We'll do BLD min OS. Uh, source disk is one. Target disk is two. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Let's go for it. I have the uh, physical write protect on on the Hawk drive, so we, we can't break the Hawk drive in this. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and get started. 
and this is gonna take a while. Just putting the text into the file took like five minutes. Uh, so this is probably gonna take something like 30 minutes to an hour. So I'm gonna go make a sandwich while I uh, let this run in the background and hopefully my uh, time lapse on the GoPro here catches it all. The copy finished, it took about 45 minutes, I think, which was uh, just enough time for me to get halfway through my lunch before it finished. <laughs> so the second half of my lunch was just me trying to scarf it down as quick as possible. Uh, now, we're sitting here on the status screen. We can see it says min OS as our floppy. Let's take a look at the directory of that, dir2 here. Uh, it's going to read the directory listing and then show us everything that's in there. We can see that we got all the heavy hitters, et load, et osn, et sys, P, S, and question mark, but check it out. Used 58 tracks, one sector, available 37 tracks. That is unbelievable. We're using, I don't know, about two thirds of the floppy. So there's still a huge amount of space on here to uh, make new ASCII files or even build new programs because we included the full compiler. Rin, you have done an unbelievable job min-maxing our operating system. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that, uh, Rin, you probably know more about the inner workings of the Centurion operating system than anybody alive today. You are in a truly unique position and I am forever in your debt. Thank you so much for this, because that is epic. Which means that our miniature Centurion with a single floppy in it is actually going to be usable and people at the event can play around with it and see what's going on. And now it's time to start final assembly by first disassembling the floppy drive. We'll just slide it right out the front then we'll remove the base plate for the drive that works by removing the two mounting screws and lifting the base plate right off. Then we'll take the working drive and slide it in from the front. Then we'll screw it down nice and tight. Then plug in the ribbon cable with adapter PCB that we made in a previous episode. And uh, we'll do a little zip tie cable management as well since the cable is way too long. Then we need to hook up the AC for the drive motor. And I'm using these crimp butt connectors because this drive is really only going to be temporarily used in this case. Uh, so next, let's get the sides and top back on. And we'll screw it down nice and tight using the uh, screws along the bottom edge here. And uh, of course, it wouldn't be an Usagi electric build if I didn't use a couple more angle brackets. So we'll go ahead and screw these in and they will hold the power supply board upright by screwing into the side panels. And then finally, we will slide the FFC card into place. Flip the power switch on, pop a floppy into the drive, press the load opsys button, type F0 on the terminal, and then we get to wait for about one and a half minutes to get to this screen where we can set the system disk, the uh, current date, which is August 23rd, 1984, and the time. And then we get to wait about another one and a half minutes again to fully get into the operating system and a uh, quick check to make sure that it's working. And yeah, yeah, that's working excellently. There we have it, fully booted into the operating system out of our custom mini Centurion enclosure here. It is working perfectly and I think it's gonna be a hit at the event, or at least I hope so, because uh, it was an absolute thrash to get it to this point in time for the deadline. If I do my job well, this video will be like a 20 to 25 minute long journey. But for me, it was like a five to six day thrash from the time that we left off on the previous episode. So it took a lot of effort, but well, even if it's not a hit at the event, I absolutely love it. I think this thing is fantastic. Uh, Although it is not very fast, it's exceptionally slow. And that's because it's only a single floppy system. Uh, and the operating system was not written around the idea of having an incredibly slow drive as their main drive. 
And the reason that I think the operating system was written that way is that very early on, the uh, first Centurions had core memory. And this was an incredibly small amount of memory. So I think they had to lean on the speed of the Hawk drive to keep the overall system experience quick. But then as the uh, system upgraded and they got up to the 128K that we have in there right now, they didn't really rewrite the entire operating system. So it still leans on the Hawk, Hawk drive a lot more than would normally be expected. And when we replace the Hawk drive with something slow like this, it's leaning on the floppy more than it should. And that brings the whole system down to this kind of slow grinding, <laughs> meandering, go make some coffee while you wait for it to open your text editor thing. But uh, the important part is that it actually works. And it didn't actually work right off the bat. The uh, memory card that we tried to fix is actually right here. And uh, I ran some diagnostic tests on it with the diag card and it passed, but uh, every time I tried to do anything more involved in the very rudimentary test, it just immediately crashed. Uh, so we still have some pretty big issues with this. My guess is that some of these sockets down here are just no good. And so we're missing a large chunk of RAM down here, but that's something we can do in the future because for right now, the entire system is actually working perfectly with the memory card from the main system. And in here we have a CPU six, a MUX, a 128K memory, the FFC, and the Diag card. And uh, all of this is going with me to the event on the 28th. So if you're local to the DFW area and you wanna see and play with this thing in person, swing on by the event. I'll put a link down below to the uh, meetup page on it so you can figure out when and where it is. And be sure to RSVP if you wanna come because that lets the uh, people who are making the event know how much pizza to order. So yeah, pizza and a mini Centurion. What's not to love about this event? So if you are coming, I'll see you there. If not, I hope you stick around for the next episode because we're getting back into some PDP 11 stuff and I'm really excited about that too. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.